So my thanks for the opportunity of speaking, and before I go on, uh, especially my thanks to my colleagues in the work uh, that I will describe this morning. Uh, I'll tell you briefly at the beginning about work done uh, by Murakami, Bushnell, Asturias, and Sai, which is a follow-up to work published only about a year ago, but extends to higher resolution. Uh, and that is by way of introduction to the main purpose of the lecture, which is a longer story beginning about 20 years ago, starting with Chris Ackerson, followed by uh, Jedskin, Jedzinski, uh, Calero, uh, and most recently Azubel and Podoli, uh, and finally uh, the originator, really a student from long before, Grant Jensen. Now I thought in honor of your birthday bank, uh, I would tell a story that you haven't heard before, at least that you haven't heard from me before. Uh, it's a story about material science, uh, but which is motivated by our common interest in biophysics and especially in uh, the, uh, so the, chem the, I would say, the nucleic acid chemistry that underlies one of the pillars of uh, modern biology uh, called the central dogma of molecular biology. Uh, we have focused on the beginning of this process, and in fact, we have focused on the beginning of the beginning of the process, which is the formation of a pre-initiation complex for transcription by RNA polymerase II. Uh, over a period of many years, we and others identified all the components of the pre-initiation complex, uh, the polymerase, general transcription factors, mediator, additional components, uh, they play multiple roles. The polymerase itself, of course, responsible for RNA synthesis, but the polymerase alone is incapable of finding the start site of a gene and beginning the process of RNA synthesis. For that, it requires general transcription factors for a particular reason that I'll explain briefly, as I say, in the introduction to this lecture. Uh, mediator, which uh, is responsible for regulation, mediator is a giant assembly of proteins that receives uh, multiple uh, regulatory inputs, processes the information, transmits a signal to RNA polymerase II, telling it how much to transcribe, at what place, at what time. Uh, the system is remarkably large and complicated. Uh, some 99 proteins assemble in a complex of greater than five megadaltons at every RNA polymerase II promoter prior to every round of transcription. So an object larger than a ribosome, but one which disassembles and reassembles uh, at every uh, stage of the process. Francis Crick is supposed to have said, if you want to understand uh, function, study structure to which many object if you want to understand structure, study, function. <laughs> Regardless, uh, we have pursued structure, uh, beginning with that of RNA polymerase II, and as many of you will be aware, about 15 years ago solved a structure of the polymerase in the act of transcription with uh, the DNA and RNA both present at near atomic resolution. I'll show that briefly to make one point that is needed to understand what follows. So in that structure, one sees uh, the DNA double helix entering the polymerase and unwinding three residues before the active center. What's important to notice is the sharp bend in the template of the coding strand, uh, in consequence of which the next base is flipped and points down towards the active center for readout and transcription. Uh, the residue of the uh, nascent RNA just added to the growing transcript is still paired with that base in this structure, there are eight more uh, RNA-DNA hybrid base pairs. Now, you will notice uh, the entering axis of the entering DNA double helix is at nearly right angles to that of the exiting RNA-DNA hybrid helix in consequence of this wall of protein density that blocks straight passage through the polymerase cleft. And it is this right angle bend that is the point uh, that you need to remember for what I will explain in a moment. As I say, this structure was solved about 15 years ago, and in the, in the intervening time, uh, we've uh, identified and solved many related structures that have told us much about the mechanism of transcription, about how 
about the basis for the fidelity of readout of the genetic code by this enzyme, uh, about how DNA and RNA are translocated across the surface of the molecule, also about how RNA is separated from the coding strand of the DNA for release into solution. But what we have not succeeded in doing is make much progress towards understanding the higher structures formed with all the many additional components of the pre-initiation complex that I mentioned. Uh, we and others have only succeeded in solving structures of five of the 22 polypeptides of the general transcription factors. Uh, one of the reasons is because these proteins, in many cases, adopt their folded conformations only in the larger assembly formed with polymerase and the additional molecules. Uh, in a major advance in our work, uh, just a couple of years ago, we succeeded in assembling a 32 protein, one and a half million Dalton assembly of polymerase and general transcription factors capable of the initiation of transcription. Uh, we have been unsuccessful in crystallizing that 32 protein, one and a half megadalton complex, but we could investigate its structure by cryoelectron microscopy. And then the, mo and the most recent work on those lines is shown here. So in this image, uh, which has not yet been rejected by any journal, uh, we uh, see the electron density map of the 32 protein uh, highly active RNA polymerase II pre-initiation complex, and you see it's divided in two parts. Uh, the lower one is a perfect fit to the crystal structure of RNA polymerase II, which is superimposed. Uh, the upper part has superimposed the few crystal structures of components of the general transcription factors that have so far been determined. The path of the DNA is clearly revealed, and it's best seen by removing the upper part, or G-lobe, uh, so here you see a view almost directly down the axis of the DNA double helix, and if you just tip downwards, you see more clearly the electron density for the DNA. And I think it's apparent one can follow the path where it enters. It makes uh, a bend at the point of interacting with the so-called Tatabox binding protein. And then one can see electron density for at least two gyres of the DNA double helix. Uh, after that, uh, the structure of straight B-form DNA uh, departs from the actual electron density. There's a bend in the path of the DNA where it interacts with one of the general transcription factors for a reason that I don't have time to describe. Uh, what is important and the point I wished to emphasize and what really reiterates what uh, a principle that we uh, recognized before, there is no contact between DNA and RNA polymerase in a polymerase pre-initiation complex. Rather, uh, the DNA interacts only with the general transcription factors. We can understand the reason. Duplex DNA is rigid on the scale of uh, a few uh, turns of the double helix, such as occur in this complex and therefore must follow a straight path in the complex. But on the other hand, as I showed you a moment ago, a bend through 90 degrees is needed for binding to RNA polymerase for entry in the active center cleft. Uh, so the solution is the DNA is brought to the polymerase by the general factors, and that is their principal role. The promoter DNA is thereby suspended above the active center cleft. Uh, the general factors then are responsible for melting, creating a single-stranded region which is flexible, after which bending can occur, and entry of the DNA in the polymerase cleft. Now, of course, we'd like to understand in more detail how melting, bending, and entry in the cleft take place, and finally, recognition of the start site for transcription. Uh, that isn't possible at the limited resolution of the analysis so far, uh, and resolution of the P lobe at about five angstroms, uh, the general factor lobe at about eight angstroms. Uh, the reason for the limitation from the cryo-EM structure determination to this point can be appreciated from the picture in this slide. Here you see a picture of RNA polymerase II from cryo-electron microscopy using the best currently available electron detector. 
the picture is obviously very noisy. Uh, the reason is because of what Richard Henderson and Nigel Unwin explained to us long ago, that one must record images of proteins such as this using a minimal electron dose to avoid damage to the protein. Uh, then, in order to improve the signal-to-noise ratio of such images, many must be averaged. Uh, it will be apparent to you, uh, or many of you are doubtless aware, that uh, averaging is accomplished almost automatically when one uh, performs a diffraction analysis, either X-ray or electron diffraction analysis. But it must be performed, as it were, manually for cryo-electron microscopy, uh, because in most cases one is not recording images of crystals but of individual molecules, and they are randomly oriented when observed in solution. Now, <clears throat> you will also doubtless realize that alignment must be very precise, uh, nearly to atomic resolution if one wishes eventually to recover a structure from averaging many images uh, that is good to that resolution. Uh, the problem is made still more complicated by the flexibility of the protein. RNA polymerase, like many large molecules, exists in multiple conformational states in solution. The problem is complicated even further by blurring of the images due to movement of the molecules uh, under the electron beam of the microscope. So the low signal-to-noise ratio of the individual images limits of the precision of alignment and of correction of microscope errors and ultimately uh, the resolution of the analysis. Uh, many years ago, about 20 years ago, uh, we thought to try to address this problem by introducing large heavy atom clusters, uh, attaching them to the protein of interest. Uh, Gold is, a gold atom has 20 times the atomic weight of a carbon atom, so we'll scatter much more strongly. A cluster of as many as 100 gold atoms might give a signal uh, high enough above the noise that it could be detected, even at the low electron dose used for recording images uh, from protein molecules. Uh, that expectation was borne out by experiment. I'll show you first here uh, a simulated image that we produced uh, to uh, uh, test the feasibility of the approach before we began. Later I'll show you actual images, uh, but the simulator is powerful and the results are virtually the same and suffices for the purpose here. You see that the gold particles uh, that I'll tell you more about are clearly visible uh, under conditions where the protein can barely be seen at all. Here you see two views of the same particles, and the point is uh, to make clear that the arrangement of gold particles uh, in these same complexes uh, can clearly be used to determine their relative orientations, thus to align and to average images for the purpose of electron microscope structure determination. Now, the reason for four particles is because the uh, images are projection images. They represent, as it were, a shadow of the structure on the detector. They're two-dimensional representations of three-dimensional objects. If one had only three particles, one could not in general distinguish or tell up from down. A fourth particle is needed to break that ambiguity. When we started, as I say, about 20 years ago, we thought it would be easy. Uh, we found a gold 55 cluster advertised in the catalog of a specialty chemical company. Uh, we ordered it. We figured we'd be done in a few months. Only when the cluster arrived, we were terribly disappointed. There was no gold 55 in gold 55. There never will be a gold 55, as I'll explain to you in a moment. It was a heterogeneous mixture. In fact, uh, all of the particles that we could obtain from any source contained a wide range of particle sizes and were useless for our purpose. So we set about synthesizing clusters uh, and spent the next 10 years learning how to do so. Uh, we began with a procedure due to Brust and Schifrin that is illustrated on this slide. It is a two-step procedure. In the first step, uh, an auric gold salt is mixed with a sulfhydryl compound to make an aurous uh, thiolate polymer. Then in the next step, that polymer is reduced with borohydride uh, to reduce the gold to the metallic state and generate a particle uh, 
uh, that is surrounded uh, by thiolate ligands. Uh, there's much interest in these uh, nanoparticles uh, for their quantum electronic, magnetic, and optical properties, and also for applications to catalysis and uh, to medicine, and in particular, the application uh, that I will uh, tell you about during the rest of the time. Now, <clears throat> the problem, as I have said, is that the product of rust synthesis is a heterogeneous mixture. Uh, here you see the particles separated on the basis of size by gel electrophoresis. Uh, we undertook a systematic variation of the conditions of synthesis. Uh, we actually tried all commercially available thiol compounds. We tried literally hundreds of combinations of gold and thiol concentration, time, temperature, what have you. And eventually we discovered how to make in a single step or in a single pot synthesis homogeneous large metal clusters. Uh, we've made many of these. Uh, and they are truly homogeneous. All that we have synthesized in this way can be crystallized. Uh, one gave diffraction to near atomic resolution, to about one angstrom resolution, uh, and we could solve the structure with the good statistics uh, that are shown here. <clears throat> Model building was easy because of the quality of the electron density map. We could uh, immediately identify the locations of carbon and white, oxygen in red, sulfur atoms shown here in blue, and the gold atoms in gold color. Uh, we could count the structure contains 102 gold atoms. Uh, it also contains 44 of the ligands, which are in this case paramercaptobenzoic acid, or carboxylic acid. Uh, I must say I I thought when I saw it, this was the most beautiful structure I ever saw. Uh, it still is. Uh, but more importantly, it is still the only structure of a large metal nanoparticle. And therefore, what principles we can derive from its study are of uh, general interest. And the first point, uh, contrary to what we had feared, uh, this is a compound of a precise composition. It had been uh, possible in the past to narrow the size range, for example, by cutting a slice out of the gel I showed you in an earlier slide, uh, but it wasn't known if one could make a homogeneous cluster or if one succeeded, whether it would remain so, or instead the gold atoms would pass between particles, disproportionate, and regenerate a heterogeneous mixture. This is indeed uh, a mat material of a precise composition. This is a defined chemical compound. It's a molecule of about 27,000 molecular weight, stable to manipulation, uh, stable on storage. The structure, as I'll explain in a moment, reveals the principle of its formation, uh, the reason for its stability, and also uh, a, an utterly unexpected structure of the surface thiolate layer. Now, the organization of the gold atoms in the central core shows immediately what is not the principle of its formation. Um, here is the organization of the core. Um, it is based on a central 49-atom Marx decahedron with two 20-atom gold caps that have C5 symmetry, and then an equatorial band of 13 atoms that has no symmetry, and that is the point. Because of the lack of symmetry of that central equatorial band, the particles are chiral. Viewed down the central axis, you see both left and right-handed molecules. Uh, and they alternate in the crystal lattice. Here, gold again is gold and sulfur blue. Uh, the lack of symmetry uh, is what rules out what was the commonly held idea for how uh, large stable particles might be formed. Uh, a, a popular notion was that they would arise from filling geometric shells. This is clearly not the case because that equatorial band that I mentioned uh, is asymmetric and there are missing uh, places for gold atoms. There are gaps in the structure. Rather than uh, filling geometric shells, it turns out what is the principle for stability is the filling of electronic shells. Each gold atom uh, 
has one 6s valence electron, 44 of which are involved in bonding to sulfur, and that leaves 58, uh, which is a number that fills a shell according to the off scheme that's listed here. So we believe that the 58 electrons delocalized over the cluster account for its stability, and we suggest that the metal cluster can be viewed as a kind of superatom. Uh, and then the reason for the additional gold atoms in that equatorial band are just to complete uh, the assembly of that superatom. Now, with regard to the sulfur uh, and the thiolate layer, as I mentioned, that also contained a surprise for us. Uh, here you see the central gold atoms uh, do not interact with sulfur. After that is a layer that form one bond to sulfur. And then finally, and this was the unexpected feature, uh, gold atoms indicated here in purple that form two bonds to sulfur. So these are not metallic gold. Uh, these are actually uh, orus gold. Uh, these gold atoms form bonds to two thiolate ligands, uh, creating what we referred to as a staple motif. The surface of the particle is covered with these. So rather than a self-assembled monolayer that used to be thought to cover gold surfaces, there is actually uh, the remnant of the gold uh, thiolate polymer from which the particles were originally derived that coats the surface. The original idea was of thiol moieties uh, that interact independently and directly with the gold surface, but instead what we have um, are these gold one or auric thiolate complexes uh, that form the polymeric coating uh, that surrounds the central particle. Now, as I mentioned, we could form many such homogeneous particles, some of which are listed here. Uh, only the gold 102 formed crystals that gave diffraction to such very high resolution. For the others, diffraction was not sufficient to place the atoms precisely, and so we turned to aberration-corrected electron microscopy. Now, there had been many attempts to solve structures of large metal particles by this approach in the past, and they were invariably unsuccessful. Uh, Maya Azabel realized that not only uh, are molecules made of light atoms like proteins susceptible to damage by an electron beam, but also these particles formed from heavy atoms, and she applied uh, the same low-dose approach used to solve protein structures by cryo-M uh, to these uh, gold nanoparticles. She arrived at a beautiful map of the gold 68 particle, part of which is shown in this slide. So here on the left, you see some of the images in which, uh, with the use of the aberration corrected microscope, uh, rows of in individual atoms could be observed. And then this is a part of the electron density map that clearly shows the positions, in this case, of eight of the 68 gold atoms. Now, <clears throat> uh, we could not determine the locations of the sulfur atoms uh, by electron microscopy, uh, but we could infer their locations indicated here in green from the bonding motif in gold 102, and these locations were confirmed uh, by Hanu Hakkinen and a group in Javaskala in, Sw in Finland uh, by density functional theory calculations. We have gone on to solve such structures of many of the other gold nanoparticles, and I find the results absolutely fascinating, and I'd love to spend the rest of my time and that of the, next, of the following speaker telling you about it. Uh, but uh, I thought in the remaining minutes I would return to what was the original objective from long ago, and that was to improve the resolution of cryo-electron microscopy, and in particular to solve the structure of that very large RNA polymerase to pre-initiation complex. I'm, when I say this, I'm always reminded of a cartoon that I once saw. You'll imagine the image when I tell you the caption. It says, uh, it was, uh, when you're up to your ass and alligators, it's difficult to remember your initial objective was to drain the swamp. <laughs> and in this case, the initial objective, as I say, was to uh, improve the resolution of cryo-electron microscopy. 
what we got involved in doing for very many years was this foray into uh, the uh, formation, the synthesis and structure of uh, metal nanoparticles. Now for application to proteins, we need a way of attaching the gold particles uh, to sites on the surface of proteins and to the same site on the surface of every protein molecule. And for that, uh, we have turned uh, to fragments of antibodies, uh, and in particular uh, to what is illustrated here, circled in red. So most of you will know that antibodies interact with antigens through the tips of their so-called FAB regions. Um, the end of the tip uh, can be individually produced in the form of what is called a single chain antibody fragment. Uh, Richard Lerner and colleagues have created enormous libraries of such SCFVs in bacteria and in bacteriophage from which uh, such molecules directed against virtually any epitope of any protein may be derived. Uh, with their help, we have made uh, SCFVs directed against four sites on the surface of RNA polymerase II. In order to uh, at attach the SCFV to a gold particle, uh, we've introduced a sulfhydro group at the point indicated here on the surface of what is a crystal structure of a single chain antibody fragment. And then uh, we developed the chemistry uh, for thiol exchange to uh, bring about the addition of one and only one protein to every individual gold nanoparticle. So we have what is shown schematically here then, uh, the reagent required for our experiment, uh, gold labeled single chain antibody fragments. In this picture you see RNA polymerase II molecules such as I showed you before with the simulator, but now these are the proteins which are not visible um, and then the four gold particles attached to them. In this field of view there are some proteins with two, some with three, and others four. All of those with four that are circled in red could be related to a unique conformation of four gold particles attached to RNA polymerase. Uh, we're at the moment in the process of developing of both collecting many images such as this and developing the computational tools to exploit the gold for both alignment and the correction of the microscope errors. Uh, and that work is still in progress. I thought I would just mention in conclusion, we have reason for uh, optimism uh, to look forward to a successful conclusion because of that simulation I showed you before in which we could reconstruct from only 1,500 images uh, an electron density map of RNA polymerase that fits the crystal structure of the polymerase and the gold particles quite well. Uh, if there were no gold present uh, from the same reconstruction, we would obtain only this featureless blob that you see on the right. The uh, uh, cryo-EM structure that I showed you at the beginning of the minimal one and a half megadalton complex was obtained from 160,000 images. Uh, and that gives you a sense of what we may hope to gain from the use of gold, uh, which as I say in this case has really not uh, been fully exploited. So it is my hope then uh, to tell you uh, and return at the time of a future birthday bank to tell you about the structure of the complete 99 protein RNA polymerase to pre-initiation pre -initiation complex determined from cryo-electron microscopy. I only don't know which birthday it will be. Uh, but I can say we can both take comfort from the Hebrew birthday greeting, which is until 120. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you so much. There is room for questions to Roger Kornberg. Should we start off with, <laughs> with Bengt, please, uh, microphone. <laughs> I can't hear myself. Lovely talk. Okay. Um, I, uh, if we go to the beginning, uh, the straight B form DNA uh, before the bend. Um, a student of mine, 
discovered uh, using the technique that Bustamante has uh, applied using laser tweezer, that uh, normal BDNA is subject to, when subject to stretching forces, undergoes a conformational change. And uh, uh, it's a very, it's a surprisingly big change. It's a 51% elongation in, in length and uh, followed by what we think is an inhomogeneous rearrangement so that triplets of stacked bases remain in a B form. And I noticed you had three bases before the bend, then followed by quite a big gap. So if three bases takes about 10 angstrom, the gap is five angstrom, allow, allowing for some flexibility. Exactly this structure is found in bacterial recombinase complexes with DNA, such as Rec A, and also in the human RAD51 complex. We don't understand uh, the role of this um, uh, rearrangement, which apparently is based on a physical property of DNA. So Darwin has used something that is there. And I wonder if this is the same thing you have here. So that's a very helpful idea, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because a portion of the structure, it seems, is clearly canonical B form, and that is the first uh, 10 to 12 base pairs extending from the point of contact with the Tata box binding protein at the, what we call the upstream end, uh, to near the point of contact with the next general factor at the downstream end. But you may have noticed, and I'll just remind you, there is a peculiar bend in the DNA that happens at that point and a loss of apparent B-form structure. And it would be beautifully explained by the observation that you have just mentioned. Uh, it remains to be seen at higher resolution where, whether it fits exactly uh, the picture that you've described. But it could very well be. Fascinating. Um, are there some more questions over there, please? So, Roger, uh, this beautiful compound that you've made, uh, the beautiful gold cluster compound, I I'm curious about the choice of attachment by one sulfhydryl group. Uh, why not bind it by two sulfhydryl groups or three sulfhydryl groups to force a much more well-defined orientation of the, comp of the gold compound to the, the uh, antibody fragment? Absolutely. And so we've, there are two ways to, uh, what you're referring to is terribly important. We need a rigid, as you already have perceived, uh, a, a, a rigid attachment of the gold to the, pro, to the antibody and then the antibody, of course, to the protein in order to solve structure to high resolution. Uh, there are two ways to do what you've just said. Uh, one, to take advantage of the charged surface I mentioned that the surface here is of the particle, of the gold particle, is decorated with uh, benzoic acid moieties. So in fact, what we do is to introduce a patch of positive charge right around that sulfhydryl group. The second, as you suggest, is to introduce multiple sulfhydryls. Uh, we haven't done that just because it complicates production of the protein with the form formation of disulfide bonds, but it is a good idea and we'll certainly try it, if it's necessary, to rigidify the complex. But we've begun, and it appears we may be successful just with anchoring the particle, taking advantage of the electrostatic interaction. Yes, please. Well, Roger, uh, congratulations on becoming a really oh. great inorganic chemist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need more. <laughs> Uh, but my question is, uh, did you ever consider using some of these big platinum carbonyl clusters, uh, which I thought uh, some of them were structurally characterized? The I may be wrong, but I thought some of the big platinum carbonyl ones were really quite well characterized. And, um, but there are some large platinum compounds which have a mostly crystalline core. Yeah. And those have been analyzed. But uh, in the first place, we need smaller particles. We need them in the range that I told you about, I see. 60. Okay. Uh, and the reason, and, and I'll t tell you what is the concern. It's because I didn't want to go into this in detail. It was the reason why we performed those simulations. We worry about what is called a CTF mismatch. There's a 
Contrast is generated in the microscope by, as you probably are aware, phase rather than mostly scattering mm -hmm. contrast for determination of such a structure. And scattering from gold is so different from that from protein, we worried about a mismatch of contrast generation, and that was why we performed these simulations. Uh, so uh, what we found is that a particle of 68 is small enough that it still behaves like a weak phase object, and it can be used for this purpose. Much larger complexes not. The second point is that um, the gold particles are, of course, of particular interest for a variety of reasons that I mentioned. And uh, only in this case do we actually see the structure of the surface ligand layer. And I don't think that was determined in any other example. No. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any more question? Yes, please. Would you like to give us an idea of how confident you are that there isn't really important differences in the, in the conformations of your complex? So uh, how you're talking about rigidifying your uh, complex by various means, but it may well be that, that the actual complex does a lot of, of, of motion. Um, and you really, you know, you mentioned it, but you didn't really say what, how you were going to account for that in your experiments. So one thing I didn't, I mean, there are many possible uh, benefits, things to be gained from attaching these uh, defined metal complexes to proteins for study in this way. And one relates directly to your question, namely uh, the interesting conformational flexibility, which is a property of many, perhaps most, very large uh, biological particles, certainly those of great interest. I mean, people are accustomed to seeing structures of the ribosome. It's an exception. It's a rock. That was the reason why it could be uh, elucidated from a structural standpoint, not only by X-ray analysis, but more recently by electron microscopy to such high resolution. One of the reasons, anyway. Uh, but the pre-initiation complex that I mentioned is highly flexible. Uh, the polymerase itself within that complex, flexible. Um, many, again, I think I'd be right in saying just about every such object that I can think of of such size exhibits a range of conformational states. Those can, in some, in some cases where conformational flexibility is limited, uh, be addressed by computational analysis in the same way as alignment is done. Mm -hmm. but by in, families, in, yeah. But... But, um, again, that, that will be useful, I think, only to a limited extent. And one wants to see the full range of conformational flexibility. By using the power of SCFVs and the libraries that Richard has produced to decorate many, many sites on the molecule, one will be able to see what are the independent moving parts, how they move with respect to one another, and then solve the rigid components individually. Yeah but you've still got to worry about the motion. But, sorry, but I'm saying if you... You're, we, look, one, you're one talking needs about to, static I, I didn't heterogeneity, and what I'm saying is that a lot of it, a lot of the function's going to be motional. You know, you're going to have And to all I'm suggesting is that by detecting all of the motions of all of the parts with respect to one another, and knowing what are the populations of all those states in solution, and under conditions of activity, one may be able to accomplish what is the purpose of your question. Sorry, we, we have to quit now. We, you, have to save, you have to save your question to the panel discussion. So, so uh, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> all right, all right. One more question. I invite you to have your question, please. So the, quest the question is why are these extraordinarily well-defined particles chiral in this way? And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, that what I referred to as an equatorial band of 13 gold atoms is asymmetric, and it is that asymmetry which imparts chirality, but the chiral structure extends to the surface layer. And so ultimately it is the pattern of interactions of the uh, thiolate ligands on the surface, which uh, result in the full expression of what is ultimately chiral, and as I mentioned, they then alternate in the crystal lattice, or I may have mentioned. <laughs>
All right, thank you. Uh, a big hand to Roger Cromberry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.